Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman, and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. We are hosting weekly events that bring you news, knowledge, and entertainment to help you explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, faculty, and staff experts. You'll hear me say this just a few times today, but I really encourage you to visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I'm excited to start our program this evening by welcoming our guest speaker, Mark Kravicina, who is the Senior Technology Manager in the UIC Office of Technology Management, who will walk us through the basics of intellectual property. Thank you so much, Mark, for being with us this evening, and I'll turn it over to you to start the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, I'm in control of the slides. So what I'm gonna do tonight is go over some intellectual property basics for you. Um, this is something that I do at the University of Illinois at Chicago. We have uh, about staff, 10 to 15 people who manage the intellectual property that gets created at UIC. And I'll give you some information at the end about how we actually take the intellectual property um, generated by professors and students and commercialize it. So my name is Mark Kribchenya. I've been at the university for a little over 10 years. My background is in food chemistry. I'm a food scientist by training. I worked in General Mills and product development for many years. And so a lot of my examples might be food related. So that's just my bias of my background. Um, and I'm gonna make this presentation available to you all. And I just wanna point out to you that I have copy, since we're talking about intellectual property, I've copyrighted my PowerPoint. Um, I'm an employee of the university, so the copyright is owned by the University of Illinois Board of Trustees. And I'm giving a permission statement here. The following materials may be freely used for all non-commercial purposes. So you're allowed to use my PowerPoint as long as you don't try and make any money off of it. Um, if you try and make money off of my PowerPoint, then theoretically I could sue you. So here's what the roadmap's gonna look like for tonight. I'd like to do a quick poll just so I get a sense of where, um, who the audience is, your backgrounds, your interests, so that maybe as I'm going through this information, I can um, tailor it a little bit more to the backgrounds and, and interests of, of the audience. So if you could quickly answer the questions on the poll, whether you're a life science, physical science, or social science background, if you're currently looking for work or um, changing employment or employed, and the final question is, do you have any background in intellectual property? I'm assuming most of you don't, but we'll see what the poll says. Give a few minutes. Okay, so we've got a real interesting um, life science, physical science, a few social scientists, uh, a lot of none of the above. Currently employed, see, no, yeah, okay, so we've got a lot of currently employed and employed options. And the majority of people are not familiar with intellectual property. Well, somewhat familiar, okay. So anyway, that's, that's good to know. I have an idea of who you are. So what I'm gonna do first is go through just the basics of intellectual property, the four kinds of intellectual property. And then I'm going to say, um, have a few slides on how UIC manages the intellectual property that's generated on campus, and I'll provide some links. I encourage you to ask questions in the chat box as I go along, as they come up, so that, you know, the questions get answered kind of close to when 
they come to your mind. I think it'll make it more easy. And it also might help us have a conversation as much as you can on Zoom um, to answer the things that you're interested in. Okay. My screen does not want to, is not advancing. There we go. Okay. So what I'm going to just do real quickly here is just show you some kinds of intellectual property. Usually I hide these, but since you can't respond anyway, so it's a little bit, um, take some of the fun out of it. So Gatorade, you're all familiar with. Um, it's a patent, actually. It was originally a patent out of the University of Florida, um, the food science department at the University of Florida. Made them lots of money. It's also a trademark. On the left-hand side is the, the original Gatorade trademark owned by the University of Florida. And you'll notice on the right-hand side is that new G, which came out about five or six years ago. And that's a new trademark. And I'm not I didn't look up who owns it. I suspect it was the company because I didn't want to keep paying the University of Florida for uh, trademarks for using Gatorade. And maybe they wanted to brand it across different products. So patents, trademarks. Here's something you might be familiar with. This is a delicious Honeycrisp apple. And Honeycrisp was developed at the University of Minnesota by a plant breeder. It's a plant patent. And it's also trademarked. You cannot grow this variety of apples without paying the University of Minnesota um, some money for the, the rights to use the name Honey Crisp Apples. This is, it's called an iris tube. Um, the reason I bring this up is because this actually is a, about a three foot long piece of PVC pipe, which has got some paint on the outside, which you pound into the dirt and it tells you whether your soils are wet or not, hydric soils. This was invented by a graduate student at Purdue University and the professor. Uh, the graduate student started up a company, licensed this technology from the university and sells each one of those um, tubes for about 125 bucks. Probably cost them less than a dollar to make. Um, but it's very useful, saves lots of time for measuring hydric soils. And it's an example of a successful invention out of a university that's used in a startup company. And finally, um, Fit and Strong. This actually is copyright protected. It is a copyright protected exercise curriculum for osteoarthritis developed here at UIC in our School of Public Health. We've licensed it to over a hundred community-based organizations and we own the trademark and the copyright on this curriculum. So copyright and trademark, again, two examples of intellectual property that have quite a bit of value. So there are four important, there are four types of intellectual property, copyrights, patents, trademarks and trade secrets. So you know these four, you know the range. I'm gonna start with copyright, go over some of the basics on copyright, and then I'm gonna focus more on patents because that's what we see mostly at the university. And I'm gonna walk through a little bit on trademarks and trade secrets as well. So copyright law basics. First thing I'll point out, you see that circle C? That is what we are used to seeing when we copyright something. But you'll notice it's not a circle R, which is when you register your copyright. We'll talk about that. So unlike patent protection, copyright protection exists from the time a work gets created. So when I made this PowerPoint, it was automatically, I owned it. Uh, now I hadn't registered it, so it like wasn't properly notified. I didn't properly notify the copyright office. But if I could prove that it was mine, I could still protect it later on. The owner of the copyright has exclusive rights to control the duplication or reproduction, 
the creation of derivative works, and the distribution, public performance, or public display of the copyright. So theoretically, you can't take my PowerPoint and duplicate it or create a derivative work. In other words, take mine and kind of adjust, adapt it to what you want without my permission. And you couldn't give this PowerPoint presentation theoretically without my permission. Now, if you remember, I had a permission statement on my, cop on my PowerPoint that said, this is free to use for non-commercial purposes. So I actually gave you permission to, to take my PowerPoint and do what you want with it for non-commercial purposes. Mostly what you see is all rights reserved, right? Copyright, all rights reserved. That means you can't do anything with that copyright unless you ask permission from the copyright owner. So duration of copyrights is quite a long time. It lasts for 70, the life of the author plus 70 years. For corporate authors, it's the shorter of 95 years from the publication or 120 years from creation. <laughs> the times of the length of copyrights changes somewhat. And so when Disney's copyrights run out, they get Congress to pass a law to extend the copyright protection. Um, a little bit of a facetious comment. Um, so the other thing that's interesting to know, if you remember when Google Books, Google wanted to put all the books on to for free distribution, you had a lot of copyright owners protesting vehemently because if you made all those books available for free, then how would they gain any um, how could they protect their copyrighted materials? So what you'll find is what Google put online was books whose copyrights had run out. So they're old books that you can use without requiring permission from the copyright owner. So registration, that's a circle R of a copyright. To register your copyrighted materials, you have to send in your, your work your book, your PowerPoint, whatever, um, to the US Copyright Office. And you pay a fee, it's not that expensive. And then you register your copyright. And what I say to our inventors and what we do as an office is this, is if there's financial value to your work, you wanna register your copyright because you cannot um, take legal action in any kind of copyright suit unless your copyright is registered. But for most purposes, if you just want to let people know, hey, this is mine, a circle C is fine. So a circle C for a PowerPoint that has no real commercial value and for much of what gets done at the university is perfectly fine to just kind of say, I own this, this is, this is mine, um, please don't use it without my permission. So that's kind of the basics of copyright. I'm going to just say one of the things, so lots of things can get copyrighted, and you can think of many, movies, books, cartoons, music. There are other things that get copyrights that people don't think about. Um, software can be copyright protected. We have a number of curriculums here at the university that um, are copyrighted and are very valuable. So for example, Fit and Strong is a copyrighted um, exercise. We have a diabetes empowerment program that was developed here at UIC that is in over 40 states and has over 200 licenses that we've copyright protected. Um, and this is um, created um, academic um, curriculum trainings that can be protected. So don't underestimate what you might be able to protect if you're creating something valuable and even if it's just written like a curriculum or a survey, you can sometimes protect those with copyright and they can often be very valuable. So I'm assuming because I'm not getting any um, notices from um, the moderator that there are no questions because I'm gonna move on to patents now. Any, question, any questions that come up to people's minds on copyright that they want me to 
to speak to right this second before I move on? If you want to go ahead and chat them, I'm happy to ask Mark those yep. questions. So maybe go ahead, if, if there's questions, please put them in the chat and we can always come back to them and I can, if you don't mind, I'll interrupt yep. you and go back to the, oh, sorry, wait. Okay. Now there is one that just popped up, so I lied. Um, so it says, just to confirm, I did register my work, so now I use the circle R. Correct. Correct. Yep. And that has, that has very specific meaning, and it's a more powerful copyright. Okay, so another question came. If copyright, well, at a university, is it owned by the university? So that depends. Um, there's what we call traditional academic works which is what professors do as part of being a professor. They create courses, they write books. Professors own their traditional academic copyright. How, but if there's copyright created under a grant proposal, um, that is owned by the university. Um, for, and like say for a graduate student, they would own the copyright to their thesis, but we have, the rights to use that thesis and keep a copy of the thesis. So it somewhat depends upon who funds it and it whether it falls into a traditional academic work bucket or it's been funded by research. And then if it's funded by research, probably UIC would say we own it. Now that doesn't mean that um, if we if we financially benefit it from it, it won't be beneficial to the inventors. So for I don't have a slide on this, but I will tell you. So any monies that our office makes by licensing intellectual property, and that could be copyrights, patents, or trademarks, gets shared. 40% goes to the inventors, 40% goes to the university, and 20% goes to the unit where the work was created. So if the university makes money off of university employees works, 40% of the monies we make go to the inventors or the creators of that work, the creators of the, of the copyright or patents or whatever. Any other questions? Uh, yes, one more question. Uh, the person says, I'm building a physical product to take to market. Is it enough to get the schematics registered or do I need to get the actual product registered to protect it from duplication? I think, um, after we, I talk about patents, I think that'll answer your question. The answer is that you probably, it's a much stronger to protect it via patent. And we're gonna talk about that next. It was like the perfect entrance into the next piece. <laughs> yeah, great segue, thank you. So the main type of intellectual property that th people think about is patents, right? And there's three kinds of patents. There's a utility patent, which is a process or a machine or a manufacturing, composition of matter, or useful objects, stuff. 90% of patents are um, called utility patents. There's a design patent, and I have an example of this later on. It's applied more to a look or a function of re related to design, jewelry, furniture, beverage containers, um, design. And then there's a plant patent. You saw the Apple, the Honeycrisp Apple, that's a plant patent. Now I will point out to you that you cannot patent something that you find in nature, right? Honeycrisp apples are not found in nature. They were created by a plant breeder at the University of Minnesota by crossing other apple varieties and creating a novel plant. You're not allowed to patent something that you just find naturally in the world. Okay, so because utility patents are the bulk of what um, patents are, are, the, are the bulk of patents, I'm going to just say, what are the criteria for a utility patent? Well, first it has to be utility, which means it has to be useful. That's not too hard to do. Second, it has to be novel. In other words, you can't find anything out there that is identical to it or nearly identical to it. That's called novelty. The 
third feature, <laughs> it's called non-obvious. And that means that you can't put two things together that are out there that, and say, hey, I put these two things together and I've created something new. Now, if you can prove that putting those two things together isn't obvious, you might get a patent. But if it seems pretty obvious, it's an argument that you have with the patent office and your patent would be rejected as being, hey, you know, this is out there, that's out there, you put them together, that's really not uh, a creative or inventive act. That's a little bit of a subjective criteria uh, in the patent office. And when you're prosecuting your patent at the US Patent and Trade Office, it's an argument you have with the, the folks at the patent office. And finally, your patent has to be enabled. You cannot patent ideas. Now, enablement is different in different fields. So in the physical sciences, if you draw uh, a machine, a design, and according to the laws of physics and engineering, it should work, then you might be able to patent a design or a simulation of a, of a machine without having built it. In the plant, in the biological world, you actually have to create it and show that it works to say you will because, because you cannot predict in the biological world the same way you can in the physical world. So it's a little bit different depending upon the field. But these are the things that are required to get a patent from the US Patent Office. These, these are the four patent criteria. So what are the elements, the key elements of a patent? Well, they're the inventors, and these are the people who conceive the invention and reduce it to practice. So a patent isn't like a publication where you kind of put your you put your friends and your, your boss on it and you want to get so that you, people, you make people happy by adding their name to it. You really need to have an inventive contribution to, to be an inventor on a patent. And if you get this wrong, that is if you put someone on who doesn't belong, say your boss who didn't do anything to help you, or you forget somebody, say your graduate student who actually did a lot of the work and thought a lot of it, a patent can be invalidated. People can challenge a patent by saying, you've got the inventors wrong. So this is not something that we take lightly. You want to get inventorship right, and it's an objective decision. It's not, um, it's not how you feel about it. It's actually how a patent attorney feels about it. And we usually make legal counsel make that determination for us. So that's an inventor. The, the second one is the assignee. That's who owns the intellectual property right. So a patent, or, or a patent it gives you rights to do certain things. And you may have created that invention, but the question is who owns the invention? So if you're an employee of the university and you create something, most patents are owned by the university. This is not traditional academic work. Um, now, again, uh, there are exceptions. If you're an artist and you create a play or a poem, um, or if it's part of kind of what you do in your, your profession, you would, you would own that. But if you're an engineer or a chemist and you create a new compound, the university is going to claim ownership of that uh, patent. It's true of most companies. And most companies, if you make it, if you create it, the company owns it. It's part of your employment contract. So this is not unusual. The university kind of just does what everyone else does. Um, but it's important to understand that just because you invent something, depending upon your situation in life, who you're working for, um, someone else may own what you invent. Okay, the third important element of a patent is the priority date. And that's um, the official date that invention is disclosed. If you publicly disclose, I'm gonna make a general statement and then I'm gonna qualify it. But if you publicly disclose your invention, except for in the United States, you can no longer patent it. 
because you've publicly disclosed it. So it's really important that you don't publicly disclose your invention before you've protected it. Now, in the United States, you have a year from public disclosure to protect your patent. And everywhere else in the world, once you've publicly disclosed it, you can no longer patent it. So what you want to do is maintain confidentiality using public, you know, non-public disclosure agreements um, with people who you might be talking about your talking with about your inventions. I mean, you've heard a lot about NDAs, um, and they're very prevalent in the world of discovery. So priority date's really important. That's when the clock starts ticking on your patent life. The abstract is the summary of the invention. The drawings and diagrams demonstrate what the invention does. <coughs> um, you have to give examples, and you have to disclose the preferred embodiment. What this means is that the reason the patent office gives you patent rights, a monopoly on your invention to sell it for 20 years is because you're going to disclose everything you know about the invention. So if you don't do that, if you don't disclose the secret sauce, you're not, you're not holding up your end of the bargain and your patent can be invalidated. So the downside of disclosing a patent is that you make public everything you know um, the upside is that you actually now own a patent and it's very valuable and no one else can um, practice this invention without your permission. And the question is, well, what, you, what are you protecting? And what you're protecting and the most important part of a patent is the claims. And that's what defines the specific scope of your invention. This is like defining what your invention really is. So those are the key elements of a patent. Um, this is kind of what a patent looks like. I highly encourage you to just Google some patents and look at them. You can see here, um, I'm, you can see my cursor, there's the inventors, there's the assignee of the patent. Um, this is the filing date, this is the priority date. Um, here's some prior art, here's the abstract, here's some drawings. And usually at the end, there's a section called what is claimed, and that's the heart of a patent. I mean, it's not, it's all important, but this is the heart of what a patent is, what is claimed. And if you're looking about saying, hey, is my invention novel, you would go to, you would do a patent search and put in some key terms that are similar to what you're doing, and you would read the claims of patents that come up and say, hey, is this my invention or how is my invention different from this? So that's the basis, the basics of a, uh, of a utility patent. I'm, again, this is a very high level, but it's really just um, giving you the important elements of what a patent is and what, what it, it consists of. So, Again, I'm, this is a picture of like, what is this? Hard to know, but you can, looks like an eyelash on a car. Um, and it turns out to be a design patent. So what I was showing you earlier was utility patents. So now we're looking at a design patent. So this patent has no function except to make a car look cute, but it's protected. So you could not put this on your car without the permission of the person who owns this design patent. Um, in some fields, design patents are really important. Furniture design, jewelry design. Think of Apple. The Apple um, tools, the Apple, um, the Apple, the, the Apple uh, phone, the iPhone, has many design patents and there are many lawsuits between Apple and Samsung, um, which are about the look of the phone, not about how it works or what it does, but how it looks. And so in some areas, design patents are very important. They also happen to be quite a, a lot less expensive than, um, 
utility patents. So it can also be a patent strategy as well to protect what you're doing at a little bit lower cost. And I'm not gonna talk anything about a plant patent, but as I said, um, if an inventor creates a novel plant, uh, a novel fruit um, by crossing different um, varieties of crops, they can also create a plant patent as well. So the one thing I wanna mention about patents is what's called a provisional patent application. And this is what's the kind of where US is the exception. And this is important and actually universities use this all the time. Remember I told you that after public disclosure, you can't patent anything. Well, in the US, you have a year from public disclosure to protect something. And it's usually done in the form of a provisional patent application. It's similar to a regular patent application with the drawings and the description, et cetera. But it expires in one year and does not issue as a patent. It's not, doesn't require claims and it has much lower filing fees. And more importantly, it's not examined. It's kind of like getting in line at the patent office. So the reason this is important, one, it's much less expensive than filing a utility patent. Cost about $300 to find a provisional patent application. At the university, we use it a lot because we get, we have researchers doing really exciting, interesting, but often early stage research. They want to publish on their research, but it's pretty early stage. And in order to protect it in an inexpensive fashion, we will file a provisional patent application and that gives us a year before we have to decide whether we're gonna convert it to a utility patent or not. And at that point, it becomes a utility patent. And just so you know, to file a utility patent costs between eight to $12,000. If you file for international patent protection, you add another three or $4,000 on top of that. So patent protection isn't cheap. Provisionals are very inexpensive, but provisional, they don't really count unless you convert them. A typical patent application, let's just say cost around $10,000. And that's mostly to pay an attorney to draft it for you. I suppose you could draft it for yourself much less expensively, but we don't recommend that because it's really important to get it right. Um, and then to prosecute a patent, so you file an application, costs about 10,000 bucks, and then you have to argue with the patent office whether or not they'll give you a patent, whether they agree with you that your invention is novel. That costs another 20, 10 to 20,000 dollars. It depends upon how much arguing you do with the patent office. Um, not all patent applications go through. In fact, I'm sure the majority don't go through or they get modified in the process of the patent prosecution. And so to get a US patent issued, it's probably between 20 and $30,000. If you wanna protect that patent internationally, it's gonna cost in the range of 40 to $100,000 because international patents are very expensive. So, um, doing patents is not a cheap proposition. And we do lots of patents at the university, but most of them start as provisional applications um, be, until we can determine that there's some commercial value. Mark, I have a few questions for you from our audience members whenever you'd like. Whenever you'd yeah, like. go ahead. <laughs> um, so in no particular order, there was a question, I believe, um, for students at the university, if a student invents something unrelated to a course, does the university then own it? So that's a great question. And the answer is maybe, it depends. So if, if we feel there's no substantive university contribution to the invention, and that means either through technical expertise through a university employee or through use of university resources, for an undergraduate student who's not an employee of the university, we probably don't own it, or we probably wouldn't claim to own it. If you're a graduate student and you're being paid by the university, we almost certainly would own it. 
But again, there can be exceptions if it's kind of not related to your studies and it's not done in conjunction with a specific kind of a course, it might be the case. But if you're an employee or if significant university resources were used in that, the invention and reduction to practice of that work, we would probably claim ownership. Hmm. Interesting. Would you recommend but people- that's, a, that's something you can contact us and we can have a discussion about. That's what I was just gonna ask. Would you recommend people call your office and ask that? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Lots of student projects, you know, um, student design projects, um, their courses, which, you know, are where students come up with stuff and they're not using significant university resources. It's their own idea. We wouldn't claim ownership of that. And I know just as, if I can interject, as we were talking earlier, you mentioned that your office will also talk to alumni. So if alumni have ideas or need some resources and help that you are willing to, to yeah. take their calls. Yeah, and we, we, we'd be happy to talk to folks. Now, we're not probably not willing to put much time and energy into like helping you with your patents, but we will talk to you and give you advice, answer your questions. Um, we keep pretty busy with the faculty and students who are, you know, creating intellectual property for the university. But if you're a UIC alum and you call us, we'll take your call and hopefully help you answer your questions or lead you to some resources that would be helpful for you. Wonderful, thank you. A um, Couple other questions. Uh, yep. Can anyone do a trademark or a patent search? Absolutely, simple to do. In fact, I think my next slide is search tools. We encourage you to use them. There, there are lots of great search tools out there. Go for it. Great, that was, that was perfect timing. Um, uh, next question, patents seem to have their own language. Can a citizen write up their application on their own or are there attorney specialists required? You can write it on your own, but it's, it's kind of risky because it's absolutely a language of its own. And words mean certain things to the patent office. So if, if, you're, if you're really serious about what you've invented, you should invest the money to pay someone to do it right, okay? Now, if it's a hobby and you're not that serious about it, you can actually write your own patent application. Just read a patent application and follow the kind of what it does. I'm sure there's tools on the internet to help you as well. But I would, I would seriously recommend that if you're serious, pay, pay an expert to do it for you. Uh, thank you. Um, when a product says patent pending, is that the same as a provisional patent? It's actually more than that. It's, it just means the patent is either a provisional patent or it's in prosecution. It just means that it's not been issued yet. So it could be anywhere from provisional to um, in prosecution, and sometimes that takes three to five years. But it means that a patent application is on file. So that actually leads into our next question, which is how long does the process of a successful patent application take? I would say. Three to five years is a good, a, a good average. You know, on some patents it's longer and some, some it's shorter. It depends upon the area. Okay, uh, let me see if there's any more questions. Um, yep, okay, so there's one more question. Um, uh, sorry, it's just loading here. Um, Okay, how, uh, do you want to keep taking questions or do you want to go through your slides? Yeah, okay. one more question. I one think we're question. doing good on time. Yep, we are. Great. Okay. Um, how can you protect an idea for an invention, but one that you haven't yet created? Would you get a provisional patent? No, keep it to yourself. Don't disclose it to anybody. Or if you disclose it to someone, do it under a confidentiality agreement. Hmm. Um, you don't need a provisional patent unless you're serious about converting it within a year. If you, if you have an idea and you think it's valuable, don't disclose it. And then if you do talk to someone about it, do it under a confidentiality agreement. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go on. So that's, so we've talked about copyrights, we've talked about patents, the next one is trademarks. Well, you, it's a word, a symbol, a name that identifies and distinguishes the source of a, a party's goods or services from that of another's. It's a well-known name associated with the product. It may be valuable, usually often is valuable. 
It has to be used in some type, type of commerce. You just can't have a trademark and not use it. And continued use is necessary. So here's some just, you know, we can, we all know lots of trademarks. The university has trademarks. UIC, the circle UIC is a trademark. Fit and Strong is a trademark. Um, the thing about trademarks is they last forever. If you remember my example about um, Gatorade, well, that patent expired a long time ago, right? And so there's no longer, the University of Florida no longer gets royalties on the patent. They get royalties on that trademark forever and ever, right? As long as they're using Gatorade, the University of Florida is getting some money for its use. So trademarks can be very valuable, and if they're associated with a valuable product, um, don't underestimate the importance of a great name, right? So if you've got a product and you have a great name for it, it may be hard to protect the product via patent or copyright, but you can easily protect the trademarks. It doesn't cost that much to trademark something. $1,500 to $2,000 and then some annual fees, but trademarks are relatively inexpensive. So I don't have much to say about that, except that it's an underused, uh, underappreciated form of intellectual property. And if you look at those trademarks in front of you, you can see, wow, those are valuable trademarks. I used to work at General Mills. Um, I was a food scientist and developed products. If you remember one of the um, products at General Mills was Hamburger Helper. Well, that's a trademark, you know, the hand, the, the hand for the, on the Hamburger Helper, right? Some clever entrepreneur in Colorado made a, a product called Roadkill Helper. And General Mills sued them because it was um, diminishing the value of their trademark of Hamburger Helper, and they won. So basically the person couldn't use Roadkill Helper in their product because it was violation of, it was, it was playing off of a very valuable trademark from a big company, and the company enforced it. And companies will strongly enforce their trademarks. And that's true at the university too. We won't let people use the UIC name without permission and it's given a lot of careful consideration we don't want that name besmirched by putting it on slapping on a product or a service that we are not really confident in so in all our licenses we do not allow people to use the university of illinois chicago's name without our explicit permission Okay, so that's the third type of intellectual property. The fourth type is a trade secret. So a trade secrets are a little different. They're protected by state law, not federal law. The protection of the holder only if the trade secret is obtained by improper means. <coughs> in other words, you have to steal the trademark to be in violation of the, of the trade secret in order to be in violation. It has to be valuable and have a competitive advantage and subject to reasonable and you have to have, take reasonable efforts to protect it. Requires to maintain secrecy internally and externally. There's no time limit and it doesn't prohibit independent development. So the obvious example is Coca-Cola. That's a trade secret. The formula is known to very few people. They keep it uh, a secret locked up in a safe someplace, but there are ton of other colas out there, right? There's Pepsi Cola, RC Cola. I mean, there's got to be 50 colas out there. And as long as folks develop those colas by not stealing Coke's formula, that's fine. So I'm a food scientist. I can read an ingredient label. I know the ingredients in Coca-Cola, at least I know most of them, and you can make your own cola. So trade secrets are very valuable and aren't very useful in the university because it's like secrets in the university, they don't go together real well. So what happens here is that professors and students invent things and they want to publish it, right? In companies, it's just the opposite. I mean, they invent things and they usually don't want to patent things. They would rather just keep them secret. Now, sometimes you patent them because once the product gets out there, people will figure it out and they'll be able to um, recreate it, 
reverse engineer it and you want it protected with a patent. But if you can keep something a secret, um, know-how, a secret recipe, that's a, a great way to protect your invention. But like I say, at a university, it's um, not usually the best strategy. And we say this to all of the people who interface with the university is that it's like, they want us to guarantee that we can keep any, any know-how or knowledge that we license to them a secret and we will not do that because we don't know, we, we don't feel we can uphold that. So, you know, Coca-Cola, I, I actually know the formula of Bisquick. I used to work at General Mills. I know how to make Cheerios. These are all trade secrets. If you saw the machines they make Cheerios on, you would, it's was built in the 1920s and it, it's a, a, a clever and interesting way to make a food product, but you can't really replicate it very easily. And we keep it very um, secretive. There was a, a person who left the company, went to work for a rival cereal company. He happened to download some files before he left General Mills and um, they, they prevented that from going forward. Chemical processes in many industries, trade secrets are processes. So if you've got a process that you can kind of keep inside a building and hide, it's easy to keep a trade secret or easier. Perfumes, cosmetic formulations. <coughs> By de definition, trade secret is any know-how that's not publicly available. Okay, here's just a summary table of the intellectual property of the glands. Any questions? So we've got copyright, patents, trademarks, trade secrets. That's IP 101, you've just gotten all the basics on uh, intellectual property. I want to say a few words about what UIC, how we handle it, but any questions on any of those four intellectual properties? So, so we have one question that's come through. Um, if you want funding for patents and development, would you use a confidentiality agreement or a provisional patent? Um, for sure you use a confidentiality agreement. You might use a provisional patent if you felt that um, within a year you would be able to change it over to a utility patent. So sometimes at the university, it's often research grants for three or four years. Um, you don't, you've got a lot more work to do than one year to kind of know what the actual invention is going to turn out to be. So it just depends. But if in doubt, always have a, an NDA in place and you might use a provisional patent as a strategy as well. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, there's another question. Um, how is the IP for a medication or a medical therapy protected? Drugs are pr protected via patents. So that's, that's why patents are very important for drug companies. Um, that's how they make their money. And when the patents expire, then you have generics come in and the prices go down greatly. It's only because of the patent system that allows drug companies to charge you uh, an arm and a leg for a very valuable therapeutic. Uh, another question. So you had talked about the cost for patents. What are the costs for trademarks? About a thousand to two thousand dollars to get a trademark um, searched and, and, and issued, much less expensive. I'm going to go on really quickly to the last three slides, and all I want to do is really briefly just say that at the university, this is what our office does. I mean, we we live in the land of patents, copyrights, and trademarks, and it's mostly patents. And what happens is. This model is we get a disclosure uh, from faculty and graduate students and researchers. They, they come to our office, they've got an idea, they've got an invention, they disclose it to us. And we do a patentability assessment and a marketing assessment. Is this novel? Is this patentable? And does anyone care? Because just having a patent is absolutely useless. 95% of patents lose money. What you really care, a patent is a means to an end. 
if you can't make money with a patent, you might as well not waste your money on it. But most, most patents don't make money. Most patents lose money. So we do a patentability and marketing assessment. If we feel that it's patentable and there's a market potential that people are willing to pay for this, what we do a lot at the university is we try and incubate it because early stage inventions are really hard to commercialize. Um, these are a long way from products often, like it's a, a drug candidate, right? So you've got to test it in animals, you've got to clinically test it. So what we do at the university in these accelerator, we have programs that give funding to professors and graduate students to help them move their um, inventions along the discovery path so that at the end, we can maybe license them to a company or license them to a startup. Um, and almost always it's, it's to a license, occasionally it's to a startup. And that's how the university makes money, is we take the inventions, we license the patents or the copyrights or the trademarks to companies and they pay us a royalty for the rights to use the university intellectual property. And, and I will, um, and just as I've got a, a nice slide here, So the tech transfer office. So here's a link to our website. Lots of great information on patents, trademarks, copyrights, on how to start up a company, how to get funding for a company. There's a great good information at our website. Our office makes made $44 million for the university in 2019. I think we made $50 million this year. We get over 200 disclosures a year from our faculty and students. We file about 113 patents and we had about 27 patents issued um, last year or in this year. We license them and option them to companies about 43, this is all in 2019. We have 23 SBIR, STTR awards, that's small business loans that fund research. We got about eight, $9 million in funding for SBIR grants, and we had three startups in 2019 at UIC. So we're actually quite a successful tech transfer office. We're in the top 15 in the country. Um, now, to be honest, our success is because of two or three very successful drugs. We had an HIV drug that was successful. We now got Shingrix, which is a the shingles new shingles vaccine was co-invented by a UIC professor. Um, that's hugely valuable. And we have a couple other very valuable um, therapeutics. We have four FDA approved drugs from UIC, which is very unusual for a university. So that's what we do. There's lots of great information. You've got my contact information on this deck. Feel free to shoot me an email. I will try and answer your questions or find someone who can answer your questions for you. We, we love to see our alumni succeed. Um, we love to assist in that in any way we can. Um, and um, that's, that's the end of my talk. Well, thank you, Mark. Do you have uh, maybe just a few minutes for a couple oh, of questions? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so just, I think there's three or four. Uh, we had some pre-questions that came in, so thank you to those that pre-submitted. Uh, a couple of them require a little bit more research. We had talked to Mark about them before the call, so we're going to circle back with you individually. Uh, so if I don't read it here, just know that we did receive it and we will respond. Uh, one of the questions we did receive, though, is have there been significant changes to intellectual property law in the past three to four years? So the answer is yes, there have been. Um, it's called the American Invents Act. It may have been five years ago. It's significant changes in the patent law. I'm not a patent attorney. I'm a food scientist, as I told you. I, uh, I know enough to be dangerous about patent law. But actually, if you're new or coming back to the US patent system, since within the past five years, there's been very significant changes in US patent law. And I would just go online and, and and Google the American Invents Act. And you, I'm sure you can get some great summaries of what the changes have been over the past five years. 
Great, thank you. Um, next question is, how are generic drug makers able to display the brand name logo and say, and, and say, say, and say same active ingredients? I think that it, that's informative. They're not, they're just saying like, you know, if you buy the generic for Allegra, it says compare, compares to Allegra. They're not using it, it it's an informational statement. Like you could use someone else's logo if you're making a, in a paper, an informational statement, you can use it without permission. It's, it's not, um, it's informational. I, I don't think there's any issues with using someone else's trademark in an appropriate fashion. As a reference, yeah. Um, okay, does the copyright or IP only apply to the country where the person is registered? Yes. So if you have patent protection, it covers, it's only in the countries that you've got patent protection that covers it, right? And I think that covers manufacture and sales. Um, so if you have um, a US patent, someone uh, of a drug, say for example, someone can make the drug outside of the United States, but they couldn't sell it in the United States without paying a royalty, but they could make it outside of the United States if it was only patented in the US. So in some fields, international patent rights are very expensive. When we patent a drug, we have to do international patents and it costs us $100,000, $200,000 to protect uh, a therapeutic. Um, so it makes a difference. Copyright's the same. Copyright protection is by country. It can get very expensive. I imagine. Um, I think this is our last question. Uh, is it necessary to have both a utility patent and a design patent, or can a utility patent be written to cover the design as well? The person is thinking of products like the iPhone. So that iPhone has both utility and design patents. Um, I'm sure it's patented up the, up the wazoo. Um, if you're having to watch your patent expenses, which I'm sure Apple is not, you, you, you think about the strategy and what you can protect most cost in a most cost efficient manner. So that really probably depends upon the invention, whether you can protect the design along with the, with the kind of inventive machine. Um, I couldn't answer that without the specifics, but um, often if you've got a valuable invention, you have both design and utility patents. Okay, great. And I, I know the uh, alumna that submitted that question. So if she has additional questions, I'll encourage her to email us and, and we can share them with you. Um, well, thank you. Uh, oh, there's one more that came in. Um, real quickly, can a confidentiality agreement expire? Yes, it does. It has a length. It has an, it has a, um, it, it goes for a certain length and some, some of the terms of the confidentiality agreement go beyond the actual confidentiality period. So for example, we often sign one year confidentiality agreements, but the confidential information remains confident, confidential for the next three to five years or something. It's negotiated, the length. There are many NDAs or confidentiality agreements online you can look at. Um, but yes, you decide what the length is and what the terms of expiration are. We would never sign a confidentiality agreement that goes on forever and ever, because then basically you're saying you can never talk about this stuff. And again, at a university, that's something that is, is not very helpful. Not practical, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We really appreciate you spending this time and all this knowledge with us. And I want to add an additional thank you for your willingness to talk to our alumni if they have questions and to call your office and reach out. And I know there's some additional questions that are going to help us answer. So thank you again for spending the evening with us and, and for all of this information. Um, please join us next week on uh, Wednesday, July 15th for our next alumni exchange event at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, featuring Design Your Life coach, Erica Jones, who will present an interactive discussion on reframing success, designing your career in a post-COVID world. As always, you can find more information at go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. And of course, please do be on the lookout for that survey I mentioned at the beginning. It only takes 30 seconds and we appreciate the feedback. Thank you again to Mark for, for all of your time and talent this evening. 
for this wonderful presentation. Thank you to all of you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again at the next UIC Alumni Exchange event. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much.